Madam President, Commissioners, it is now 11.45. All right, thank you, Director Wong. Welcome, everyone. We'll go right into our pre-commission agenda, and we'll start with general housekeeping items. Any issues or items of concern or announcements? Discussion of our agenda for today's meeting? Any comments, concerns, changes? All right, hearing none. Director Wong, straight to you. Well, thank you. Well, uh, uh, Commissioners, good morning, and I'd like to start off with letting you all know that the Again, we have a very important event occurring tomorrow here at the Ada County Highway District. And of course, that is Commissioner Hansen's birthday tomorrow. I see him smiling uh, on, on the side right there. Uh, so Commissioner Hansen, uh, happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Another year older. Anyway, um, commissioners, um, as I think I've shared with you earlier, the impact fees received in October we're about 19% below what we received at the same time last year. Additionally, we have seen a decrease now for about the last six months on impact fee revenue as compared to that same time uh, last year. Uh, currently, uh, we do see this as a flat or somewhat declined uh, commercial uh, investment uh, a strategy going on with the residential that's just uh, keeping everything where it needs to be. Uh, as you know, we, uh, based on the budget you approved, uh, we have a target of $22 million for FY21 on impact fee investments, and uh, currently, right now, we believe we'll hit those even with the, uh, what we see as a decline in, uh, in commercial. Of course, we'll keep you posted on that. Um, uh, the annual audit continues, uh, and as, as of today, uh, we've had no negative comments uh, or no negative news. Uh, we do expect to have this completed by the end of this month because, as you know, this is a very involved and lengthy annual audit for the ACHD. Uh, as I believe I've also shared with you, Commuter Ride uh, continues to do great jobs uh, uh, maintaining 68 routes in service. However, uh, we have signed contracts for now with Bogus Basin to put an additional 14 uh, in service uh, beginning here in the very near future. I believe they'll open up, they're planning to open up around November 27th. Uh, and so, so that's great news uh, both for Bogus Basin and for our, our commuter ride operations. Um, for the week of 25 to 31 October, we did issue and collect uh, $3,000 in fines due to uh, related traffic control issues. I will say that uh, the main violating uh, contractor has been removed from working in the public right-of-way by his client uh, after discussions with us. So uh, again, I do look forward to the day, and I hope it's soon, uh, that, the, uh, uh, that the number, as opposed to being a plus, would be a zero uh, when it comes down to uh, traffic control issues. Uh, for your small cell license update, again, we have 140 sites that are installed and active with 112 of those with the 5G antennas on them. We have 105 additional sites that have been have approved construction drawings, and we have 109 additional sites on top of that uh, that are in pre-application phase. And of course, we'll continue to update you on a weekly basis. Um, of interest and of note, uh, we will attempt to acquire a COVID-19 grant uh, from the state uh, for reimbursement. Um, if we want to go forward on this, for our effort to automate adjustments for school crossing flashers. Uh, as you know, uh, the school systems are, uh, are, are doing their best to meet the different COVID challenges that go on regarding when schools in session and when it's not. And what you may not know is that each one of these school crossings requires a manual uh, uh, tweak to adjust the timing. It's not like we can do from the uh, like we do with with the signalized timing from the uh, traffic management center we have to send a technician out there one at a time and there are 248 school crossings with signals uh, on them plus an additional uh, group that has uh, no signals uh, and such so we are looking at technology that will allow us to do that remotely from the tmc uh, uh, much more expeditiously much more responsive uh, when the schools let us know that they've changed their uh, their, their in-school sessions. That cost is estimated to be about $700,000. So that's why we're looking for a grant. I've already spoken with uh, uh, members uh, that will be meeting with the governor's uh, team on this before we ask Ada County. 
uh, if they'd be willing to put this uh, under their umbrella to see if we can get somewhat of a thumbs up. But it is a safety issue, and uh, again, uh, we believe that with the continuing uh, uh, challenge that Idaho will be going through and Ada County will be going through, this will be very beneficial for us to be able to very expeditiously um, uh, change uh, the school flashing times uh, when the schools do change those times. And of course, we'll keep you posted on this. Uh, uh, I shared this with, I believe, some of you earlier, but um, this earlier this week, uh, Commissioner May and our team did meet with the Harrison Boulevard representatives to continue the collaborative effort in addressing speeding as we briefed you last week. The neighborhood representatives have asked us to take a collective pause uh, for the neighborhood to continue and discuss options and considerations internally, which will also include discussions with the Historical Society, which, as you know, that was one of the key uh, first uh, uh, th uh, things that the neighborhood and the 80 County Highway District wanted to do regarding Harrison Boulevard. The collaborative request uh, is to continue the great dialogue that has been ongoing throughout the winter with a goal of having a pilot project in place by spring time frame. Uh, and of course, the staff wholeheartedly supports the neighbor's request, neighborhood's request, and efforts, and we will continue to provide um, uh, all of the neighborhood with all the information they need toward the joint goals that I briefed you and, uh, and the Boise's leadership on most recently. As a reminder, ACHD will be closed next Friday in observance of Veterans Day, and we will uh, we'll be hosting our annual Veterans Day luncheon although modified uh, this year to ensure we are in absolute compliance with CDC, Central Health, and the government's guidance uh, uh, regarding uh, COVID prevention and such. Uh, we'll keep you posted as this goes forward. And finally, we will be formally saying goodbye, uh, fair winds and following seas, to Mr. Dave Wallace on November, on November 20th, and that's his last day of service for ACHD, and I do understand his team is plotting uh, to make sure this is a memorable uh, send-off for the Deputy Director. So, Commissioners, with that, that's my update, administrative update. I do stand for any questions you might have. Thank you, Director Wong. Commissioners, any comments or questions for Director Wong? All right. Hearing none, Director Wong, thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, we are taking next Wednesday off. It will be closed Wednesday for Veterans Day. Thank right. you. And so, Commissioners, you have about six, six minutes or so, six or seven minutes. All right. Perfect. Thank you.
I'd be ready. Do, 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 do. Okay. Madam President, Commissioners, it's now 12 o'clock. All right. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I will now call our November 4th Commission meeting to order. And Director Wong, if you would please lead us in the pledge. Thank you. You all stand and please follow me. I pledge allegiance to the flag 
of the United States of America, of America. to the republic, and to which republic stands, for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you very much. All right, today we are recognizing three of ACHD's inspectors. There they are up on the screen for their outstanding efforts in keeping ACHD on track during these most challenging of times. Jake Spencer and Jim Pickard have done a tremendous job throughout the pandemic in keeping all of ACHD's subdivision and zone permit inspections testing and ADA compliance actions going all while juggling ACHD's inspector assignments to cover all requirements regardless of the staff shortage due to the COVID-19 quarantines. Additionally, Bill Thompson's stellar performance during the very complex Coal and Victory Intersection Project ensured success in all avenues. Combined, these three outstanding professionals epitomize excellence in all that we do. Please join me in thanking and congratulating Jake, Jim, and Bill. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, our first item on our agenda is to adopt the agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, next, consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion on these items unless a commissioner or a citizen so requests, in which case the item will be removed from the consent agenda and placed on the regular agenda. All consent agenda items are commission action items unless noted. Do we have a motion? Madam President, I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. Thank you. All right. All right, we have a motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, motion carries. The first item on our regular agenda, first and only item, is the FY20 fourth quarter impact fee report. And is Christine Tandler on to present to the commission? Madam President, I am here. Oh, there you are. I thought I saw you. <laughs> well, welcome, Christine. Thank you. All right, um, so <laughs> Madam President, Commissioners, for the record, Christine Tandler, uh, Budget Coordinator. I'm here to present the uh, just an informational briefing on the impact fee program. Well, no, this morning, um, I realized I had um, erroneously included the deferral payment. Um, so the balance that you'll see in this report is different than the one that you have. But I have sent the corrected one to Stacy, and it'll be on the record for the um, corrected information. I apologize for that. So uh, beginning of FY20, we started with a loan balance of $7.9 million. At the end of <laughs> the fourth quarter, um, the impact fee program has a positive balance of $1.2 million. The main impact fee projects are the 10-mile uh, Eustick Contenden, which is two projects, Cold Victory, uh, Linder Franklin to Pine, and the, the finishing construction of the Coal Franklin uh, project. The Extraordinary Impact Fee Program started the year with $1.5 million and ended with $2.2 or $2 million, excuse me. The reason for the negative balance on the Warm Springs Mesa is that we pay out those fees that come in, and a lot of those fees tend to come in with the cities, um, so we didn't get that revenue until uh, October, but it'll all balance out at the end of the first quarter of 2021. So um, this is uh, the amended ordinance 246. Uh, we The loan from the general fund to the impact fee program has been fully repaid, and the impact fee program has a balance of $1.2 million. I will stand for any questions. Thank you very much, Christine. Commissioners, any questions or comments for Christine? Yeah, Madam President? Commissioner Baker. It's not a question, it's just a comment. I remember when I first started on the commission, the balance was like, well, 40 some million, and now it's nothing. 
Plus, we collected all those impact fees in the interim, and so you just you think just how much money impact fees have paid over the years um, to improve our road system, and yet it still isn't enough. So I just uh, it's just just uh, I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. Commissioners, any other comments or questions? All right, hearing none, Christine, thank you very much. All right, that takes us to our next and final item on our regular agenda, which is uh, public communications. Ms. Spencer, do we have anybody here with us that would like to address the commission? I don't have anyone. All right. There are no other comments, then we will stand adjourned. All right, commissioners, we have four presentations today on our post-commission work session, and we will start with a overview presentation on the Idaho Transportation Study, and we will be hearing from Dr. Vanessa Fry. She is the Interim Director of the Idaho Policy Institute, Boise State University. Dr. Fry, if you're here, we are ready to turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Commissioner okay. May. Uh, good to see everyone. Thank you. And I believe that I'm going to be able to share my screen because that's what I'm going to go ahead and start doing. So it's like yes. make me sure I can do that. Yes, I can. Very and good. So, so yeah, so thanks to you, to the other commissioners, and to Director Wong for inviting me to come and uh, virtually be at your meeting today. I'm going to go through the results of the transportation infrastructure study that Idaho Policy Institute has been working on for the past about a year and a half now. And um, I'm just going to get started. So first, a, a big thank you to all the different organizations, including ACHD, that helped financially support this study. We couldn't have done it without your support. Uh, we also want to make sure we extend a, a huge thank you to LTAC and, and ITD for supporting us through uh, using their data. So although they weren't financial supporters, I would say that their support was invaluable as well. And really a big thanks to, to ACHD, Director Wong, and, and the staff for the amount of time they gave us. And Director Wong gave excellent feedback when, when we needed it. And I just really appreciate the time and effort they helped um, support for this project. This is the team that I got to work with on the project. So that's myself, Lance McGinnis-Brown, Gabe Osterhot, and Emily Pape. And just to give you a background, the, this project has really started with um, the kind of building off of the governor's task force report that I'm sure many of you are familiar with that was released in 2011. Then uh, Governor Otter put now Governor uh, Little in, into uh, charge of this task force that released this report and looked at modernizing transportation infrastructure in the state and really specifically looked at the cost of, of doing that modernization. Now, fast forward almost 10 years, we were approached by Wayne Hammond at um, Idaho Associated General Contractors, and he said, you know, I think it's, I think it's time to update this report and uh, come to find out after many meetings he had with those stakeholders that you saw on that previous slide, there were quite a few people in agreement and organizations in agreement that the report needed to be revisited and, and looked at. So we built off of that task force report. We also built off of a report that Idaho Policy Institute uh, put out in 2016. And that was specifically looking at the economic impact of investing in transportation infrastructure. So that was the foundation for this project. So we sought to, to answer this question, the, these research questions throughout the course of this project, uh, looking at what the state of transportation infrastructure is across Idaho. Really wanted to see what had changed since the governor's task force. And then what sort of alternatives, and we call them policy alternatives, might be available to addressing any, any gaps and needs that the state might have? To, to answer those questions, we set out on a number of tasks. This is just the, the main ones. The first thing we did is we met with those stakeholders and supporters that you saw on that second slide and really sat down and got a good understanding of, of mapping the stakeholders and the data that they had and information that they could share with us regarding what was going on with infrastructure in the state. And then we were able to, to evaluate it, and we didn't evaluate specifically the condition of, of different roads in the state. What we did is we, we worked with those experts, including engineers that know the, 
the lifetime of an asset, and we were able to use that and calculate the um, what deterioration might be happening over what course of time, and then what sort of revenue would be necessary to address those those needs. And then we looked at different alternatives. So we did indeed, I, I don't think it's any surprise now, uh, the report's been out for a bit, but we did find a, a gap in revenue need. And so what we did is we analyzed different alternatives that all um, other states had done to address their revenue gap needs. And we took those into consideration for the project. So now we've got an, a number of different um, resources available to decision makers. So we've, we've got these presentations that we're giving and a, and a slide deck. We have a, a, a written report, like a long narrative report, about 15 pages. We've also created two dynamic tools. One is an interactive map of those policy alternatives I've been talking about. And the other one is what we're calling is a dynamic financial model. That's what that we use that model to help us make a determination regarding the, the financial needs of the, the state to address the infrastructure that we have and that we might need in the future. And that that dynamic financial model is now a tool that is available for people to go to our website and see um, if different revenue decisions were made, what kind of impact those might have on the um, the revenue we were able to generate in the state. So kind of going through those research questions, what has changed since the, the governor's task force? So we all know Idaho has changed quite a bit over the last 10 years, and a lot of that has had to deal with the growth that uh, we've seen across the state. Really specifically, I mean, you all are, are seeing it even more acutely than other places of the state here in Ada County. So we've seen uh, across the state, again, this 14% uh, population growth. We've also seen a, a growth in uh, licensed drivers. And then we've seen an increase in registered vehicles. And the reason why that registered vehicle number doesn't track exactly with the, the population growth is because we believe that's not just the, the population of um, people that are have their own cars, but it's a, a sign that our economy is growing and there are commercial vehicles that are also registered. In addition, um, little about five years ago, the State House reacted to that initial task force report that the governor put out, and they were able to identify ways to enhance the revenue in the state by a tune of over $130 million, and that's since 2015. Now if we kind of look at the state of transportation infrastructure, so what does it look like in, in numbers? And these are just a, a couple different snapshots. The full report has much more detail, but we can see that um, different modes of, of transport are really important across the state. I should also make sure that it's clear the type of transportation I'm talking about is transportation that's happening on our roads and bridges. We didn't look at aviation or rail or any um, port related transportation. So this is really our roads and bridges that we're talking about and then what moves on them, including bikes, peds, and, and transit. So freight is uh, very, very important to the state of Idaho. We not only are um, bringing products in for those of us that live in the state and that are visiting the state, but we also transport quite a few products out. So that's really help, helpful to make sure that we have the infrastructure available uh, for our economic development in that regard. Bikes and bike and pedestrian use has been increasing across the state to a tune of that on a, on a daily basis, about 27,000 people in the state either walk or, or bike to work. We also see use of transit uh, increasing a bit. Uh, this is, uh, in 2018 data showed there are a little over 3.7 million passenger trips annually on transit in the state. And then finally, there are quite a few uh, passenger vehicles in the state, so about 1.8 million. Commissioner May, can we ask questions while we're going through this? Um, that would be absolutely fine. Commissioner Arnold, please go ahead. Okay, yeah, would you back up to the last slide? I have a couple of questions about this. Um, the 27,000 number of commuters that walk or bike to work, does that include um, people who have a live work situation where they basically walk downstairs um, to go to work? Uh, th are those included in that number? Uh, Commissioner Arnold, they are not. And so what we did is we looked at workers in Idaho that are identified as commuters and that are, that are working outside the home. And so this, this data, the, the 
fullest year of data that we had when we started this project in 2019 it was 2018 data. So this is uh, 2018 data. So this wouldn't reflect, none of these numbers here reflect anything related to the pandemic or COVID. So this is what was happening several years ago. Um, and, I, and, I, and again, when I look at now 2019 data that's available, that trend was still in line with those numbers. Um, it, the, all the data that's going to be collecting this, collected this year is going to be um, affected, of course, by the pandemic. Okay, and then my other question, the 3.7 million passenger trips uh, taken on public transportation, does that include um, commuter ride? That, uh, Commissioner Arnold, that does include commuter ride. Okay, so it's not just um, the VRT buses, that's also our commuter ride vans. That is correct, Commissioner Arnold. And do you have the breakdown between what's, uh, what the number is for commuter ride and what the number is for VRT? I did, we did not do the breakdown for uh, individual transit agencies across the state and put them in the report. But um, what we did is we took the data that was reported up and, and used it for the report. Um, but if anyone needed support and kind of calling out any of that data, we'd be happy to help with that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fry. Definitely, thank you. Okay, so this is a, just a, this is a screenshot of the dynamic financial model. So this is not for you to necessarily look at the numbers, but just so you can see the, um, the model. It's interactive in that there's a number of tabs across the top. You can look at the needs at the local level or at the state level. And to, to kind of build off um, a little bit about what Commissioner Arnold was asking about, we, we looked statewide. So in this financial model and in the report, we didn't pull out specific highway districts. So sometimes what, what I've said during the time of this project is that it's hard for any one jurisdiction or highway district to, to see themselves maybe sometimes in the report. Because in this report, we not only have ACHD, but we have Atlanta Highway District. And I can't think of two more opposite highway districts in the state, but everyone's included in here. So using that model and the, and the, and the data we were able to collect from a number of stakeholders across the state, our estimated revenue requirements indicate that on an annual basis, the state needs over 241 million more dollars annually. So this makes sure this is annual additional funding to what's being put towards uh, the state and local and transit system today. And what that funding would do is it would just allow for, for maintenance and preservation of existing infrastructure. That number doesn't account for any safety enhancement or capacity increasing. So um, a new bridge over the snake is not seen in that number. We can model that separately. It's hard to say the annual need for expansion because that annual need changes annually depending on what the, the large infrastructure project is. So that could be built into the model in the future if we knew that we were going to do a, a really large infrastructure project. So that breaks down into uh, 5.3 million for transit, and again, that's to just maintain the existing infrastructure. So that would be rolling stock and, and bus stops and, and those related infrastructure pieces. And then that 236.5 million, that would be for the roads and bridges in the state and local system. Now, what we found in our report and that um, has been discussed in a number of other um, investigations across the country is that there's consequences related to deferred maintenance. So if we're not able to, to come up with that revenue need that, need that we have to take care of our existing infrastructure, they're going to uh, year by year go into a state of disrepair that's going to have negative impacts across the state. Uh, so broadly, we're seeing that happen with our bridges across the state right now. So over 950 of them are considered in fair or poor condition. And then at some point in time, what happens with the bridges is they're, they're marked as such that no one can travel across them anymore because they come in, in such a state of disrepair. Now, annually, motorists uh, feel the de deteriorating infrastructure as well. So if you can think of potholes and, and rocks flying up on, and hitting a windshield, on, a, um, on average, 
uh, a motorist in Idaho can pay upwards of four hundred and twenty-seven dollars a year to to deal with the um, the, the maintenance and, and damage related to deteriorating infrastructure. So I've been talking about not only the where we're looking at the revenue necessary to take care of our infrastructure and identifying that indeed there's there's need for additional revenue, but there's a number of different ways to the state and decision makers can consider um, increasing revenue or um, addressing the infrastructure needs. So we've broken this down into a number of categories. Really the top four there, the user fees and the, the statewide and local funding, that's, that's really the only pieces that are, have recommended new revenue and ways to get that. So uh, the state could consider modifying the fuel tax or registration fees. There could be new user fees uh, that the state might choose to explore, including a concept called vehicle miles traveled. Tolling is something that other states have done. Um, might not be the, the, the appropriate for Idaho, but this is something that we've seen um, happen to be successful in other places. There are ways that we can do um, increased revenue, and maybe it's not um, ongoing, maybe it's one time, and that could be use of the general fund or modifying the sales tax, or it could be over a longer period of time. So both of those could be either a one-time thing or something that's more sustaining. When we think of what the locals can do, and um, or could do, I should say, there could be an opportunity um, if the, the legislature took into consideration expanding the local option tax that's, that's available to uh, a very limited number of jurisdictions across the state. There could be a way to modify the impact fee structure and that to make sure that the, the impact fees that are charged are done so in a way to um, increase the level of support for the transportation infrastructure. When we think of the large scale capital projects, um, enormous interchanges, new bridges, and others, we could think of different ways to do financing. So Garvey has been very successful in allowing us access to a large amount of capital to adjust our infrastructure needs. But we could also consider expanding uh, public-private partnerships and the uh, leg legislation that's associated with those in the state. And then consider exploring using a, a state infrastructure bank. There's over 30 states that have one of those. And what, that, what those banks enable the state to do is allow for very low or, or no interest loans. And it could be for large projects or small projects. Those, those loans can be used to access, uh, to use as, as matching dollars to access more federal dollars. But those have been pretty successful in a number of states. Uh, Ohio is one of the states it's been most successful in. One thing that we noticed when we looked at how other states were raising revenue and what they were using that revenue for is that um, it became evident that Idaho was one of only a few states that didn't have a, a state dedicated funding source for transit or for bike pet. There's been in some instances some funding given, but not an ongoing dedicated source. So that was just something that um, it was, you know, it was clear that other states were using dedicated revenue for those um, types of, of transport. What we did with the recommendations or with the alternatives um, that the state could consider is we put together an interactive map. And this is, again, a screenshot of that map. And a user of this mapping tool can click along the top and right now, uh, registration fees is, is highlighted. And then they can hover over a state, and they can see what a particular state is doing in regards to registration fees and another, uh, a number of other alternatives. And again, this is just, the, just to kind of come back to it, the, um, that we are, we are experiencing a gap in the required revenue to address our, our infrastructure needs. And, and this, this number does not include any expansion um, amount. So at this point in time, uh, Commissioner May, I'm happy to stand for additional questions or, or whatever you think is best. All right. And thank I'll, you very I'll stop sharing my screen. And of course, I can pull anything up if anyone wants me to. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Dr. Fry. Commissioners, any questions or comments for Dr. Fry? Okay. 
Commissioner I Hansen? Guess, that was an excellent presentation. I, uh, I heard it during the uh, conference last week too. And really appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Hansen. Yeah, a lot, lot of good information in there, a lot of hard work. And, and um, every time I hear it, I've heard it a few times too, along with Commissioner Hansen. It's always just another nugget to take away and to um, consider a lot of good funding alternatives in there. I love the interactive tool uh, on the map uh, for users to come in and, and drill down a little bit. So uh, kudos to you and your team and, and everybody that participated. It's a very worthwhile and, and valuable tool. Any other comments or questions? All right, hearing none, Dr. Fry, thank you very much for coming in. We appreciate it. For joining Thank us, you so much, <laughs> coming <Commissioner>. in. <laughs> yeah, coming in. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to in the chat box. I'm going to go ahead and put a link to the uh, web Very page good. we have dedicated for this project. Now you all can't do it during this meeting because you yeah. need to pay attention to the other upcoming presentations. <laughs> but you can go play with those interactive tools. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And thanks so much again for this opportunity. Absolutely, and we'll see if we can get that on our website as well. Thank you very much. All right, our next presentation today for our work session is going to be the Downtown 11th Street Bike Facility Public Outreach Concept Design. And we will hear from Zach, Pete Meyer, and Amy. Zach, are you there? Yes, thank you, Madam uh, President. Can you hear me all right? We sure can, welcome. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Madam President, Commissioners. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you again today on the Downtown 11th Street Bikeway. Uh, Amy and I were here last on September 16th for a work session where we presented some findings about our initial public outreach effort, as well as discussing mm. two uh, anticipated alternative concept designs that we were planning to take out back to the public for our next round of input. But uh, next round of input uh, is complete, and uh, we are here to present the mm. findings from that effort, as well as discuss a preferred alternative uh, to move forward. But before we jump into that, I'll do a quick recap on some background. So shown here, uh, highlighted in purple, is the extents of the project, um, running from River Street at the south end to the Boise High School campus at the north end and connecting into the ACHD bikeway uh, going north from there. The objectives of this project are to develop that true Ridge to Rivers bikeway uh, for folks of all abilities to have a real mo mobility choice. Um, we're trying to develop a corridor here that will improve access to homes, as well as to businesses and other destinations up and down the corridor. So the design team, which was guided by the interagency technical team, identified two possible alternatives uh, for concepts, which we uh, think might help us achieve those desired outcomes. Uh, one of which is shown here on the right-hand side called the on-street protected bike lane, uh, very similar to what's uh, currently uh, found on Capitol Boulevard. The other Alternative was called the raised bike lane, which is shown on the left hand side, which is uh, fairly similar to what ACHD recently considered for the Locust Grove and Fairview intersection project. I'll turn it over to Amy for just a few minutes to go over what we found through that recent public input effort. Thanks, Zach, and good afternoon, Madam President and Commissioner. So as Zach mentioned, I'm going to be summarizing the feedback that we received during this last round of public and stakeholder engagement on the two proposed concept alternatives for the bikeway. Uh, so between September 24th and October 9th, the project team held an online open house for the public, as well as two online meetings with 11th Street business and property owners. An online survey was also hosted by CCDC, allowing both business and property owners and the public to provide feedback on the concept alternatives. We had 30 individuals, including 12 business representatives, attend the online meetings, and then CCDC received 188 individual responses to the online survey. So that's a total of 218 responses. Uh, next slide, please. Now we're going to run through some of the specific feedback that we received from the survey data. When asked whether the bikeway and alternatives would make biking on 11th Street more comfortable for them, there was a positive response for both options, with a slight preference for the raised bike lane, which is shown in blue, over the on-street protected option, which is shown in yellow. Next slide. This question, this question asked people if they did not currently bike on 11th Street, would either of the bikeway options make it comfortable enough for them to do so? 
So again, both options received favorable response with a slight preference for the raised bike lane over the on-street protected option. Next slide. Uh, since one of the project goals is to design a bike facility for all ages and abilities, this next question focused on the family riders. We asked if you bike with your family, including ages, kids aged eight and up, would you feel comfortable using 11th Street with either of these bikeway facilities? Again, both options received a favorable response with a slight preference for the raised bike lane over the on-street protected option. Next slide. This question asked if people would support building the on-street protected bike lane or the raised bike lane option. Again, both alternatives received strong support, but a slight preference was for the raised bike lane over the on-street protected option. Next slide. When asked which option people would prefer, there was a slight preference for the raised bike lane over the on-street protected option, which you can see. Uh, this slide shows the responses when we remove the non-bikers and the confident and fearless bikers, and then isolate the data from our target audience. So that's the, what we call interested but concerned type of cyclists. These are your average recreational and occasional cyclists who may not necessarily feel comfortable biking on 11th Street in its current state. So you'll see for this target audience, uh, they preferred the raised option over the on-street option. Next slide. When isolating responses from the business and property owners, there was a strong preference for the raised bike lane alternative, which is likely due to this alternative having a lower impact to on-street parking. Next slide. Uh, so some of the other feedback we received, uh, maintenance. Uh, some of the feedback was, you know, what's the day-to-day -day maintenance of the bike lane, including sweeping, shoveling snow, what's that gonna look like, who's gonna be responsible for it? Um, at this point, we don't have all those answers, but they'll, we acknowledge that there'll need to be some future uh, discussions with the city, ACHD, and ITD about the maintenance responsibilities. So that's on our, on our radar. Uh, the next concern uh, was pedestrian conflicts. So in the raised bike lane option, people expressed concerns between the mixing of pedestrians and cyclists and how to keep uh, people in their respective spaces. So the furnishing zone between the raised bike lane and the pedestrian zone does offer some separation. So there's corresponding amenities like the street trees, planters, bike racks that provide that physical separation between cyclists and pedestrians. Um, but as we get further on, along in the design, we'll also be exploring various signage, striping, and other distinguishing uh, aspects to really demarcate those two spaces. Um, Another point that was brought up during these outreach was the need for additional public outreach and education prior to the implementation of the bikeway facility, which we thought was a great point um, to really focus on educating the public before this option or the, the bikeway facility gets implemented so people know what to expect and know how to use it properly. Uh, visibility was another concern that was brought up. So both at driveways and coming out from behind parked cars and the on-street option, the raised uh, bike lane does offer, offer improved cyclist visibility to motorists since bikers are elevated six inches above the driving surface. Um, parking, so businesses along the corridor have always indicated that maintaining parking along 11th Street is a priority for them. The raised bike lane retains on-street parking on both sides of 11th Street. And then uh, we did have to remove 20% of the existing on-street parking just for the visibility purposes at both driveways and intersections. Um, but this was much less than the impact when compared to uh, the on-street parking option, which removes almost or more than half of the on-street uh, parking. Um, next slide, please. Now Zach, Zach's gonna take it back. Yeah, so Amy just went over several of those uh, elements comparing the two, but the design team put together this nice kind of visual graphic illustrating um, a number of those evaluation criteria and how each compares. And so when considering cost and pedestrian comfort, uh, the on-street protected option provides a slight benefit over the raised option. However, when you consider ongoing maintenance, bike comfort, vehicle operations, the parking impacts that Amy discussed uh, uh, and their Therefore, the preference of the business owners along the corridor, the raised bike lane alternative rises to the top. And so I'll, I'll pause right there, Madam Chair. If there's any questions from any of the commissioners about any of these criteria, we can definitely dive into those. All right. Thank you, Zach. Commissioners, any questions or comments? 
for Zach or Amy? My, my only comment is I know Mr. that Hansen? our Mike Advisory Committee has looked at this and provided some input. Does that comport with what uh, your analysis is, or have you seen it yet? They only just met on uh, Monday. Yeah, Madam Chair and Commissioner, yes, that's actually on the next slide. I just wanted to pause briefly before I got left this slide uh, to move on to that topic. Appreciate it. Thank you, Zach. Okay, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, so with that, uh, comparing the two alternatives, uh, CCDC staff, the city, and the BAC, who met again on Monday this week, uh, did all provide a, a recommendation for the raised bike lane option, which is again shown here. Uh, in a rendering on the right-hand side and then kind of uh, an example on the left-hand side here. Uh, because the anticipated benefits from the raised bike lane appear greater, um, um, we feel that that is the option to move forward into final design and implementation. So next steps going forward, Ken Kittleson, uh, the consultant on this project, continues to refine the raised bike lane concept in preparation for a CCDC board meeting on November 9th, and then we'll be back here uh, to the commission on a November 18th meeting for the public hearing to uh, ask your your um, uh, official adoption or approval of this alternative to move forward. And with that, we'll we'll stand for any other questions. All right, thank you, Zach. Commissioners, any other questions, comments, concerns? All right, hearing none. Zach, thank you for coming in, joining thank us you. today and giving us this presentation. Appreciate it. Amy, I'm glad you're gonna do that additional outreach there at the end before implementation yeah, to educate. I think that's critical. Yeah. <laughs> Smart thank move. You thank you. All right, thank you both. All right, next on our agenda is the Meridian Development Corporation and City of Meridian presentation. We'll hear from Ashley Ford Squires along with Jason Korn and Gary Ashby. And I believe you're going to start with Ashley. Ashley, are you, are you uh, with us? Uh, uh, can you hear me okay? We sure can, welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam President and Commissioners. I apologize, I'm not turning my camera on. We are experiencing some bandwidth issues in my neighborhood today, and so I just wanna make sure we can get to this presentation, or at least my part, before everything falls off. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today about this infrastructure project that is over a decade in the making. I've been the administrator for a decade now uh, with MDC and uh, you know, this is just this is one of those projects that I'm going to see through to the very end because it's so important. But just to back up, my name is Ashley Squires. I am the administrator of Meridian Development Corporation. We are the city's urban renewal agency. Today, I have two team members with me, um, Jason Korn from the city of Meridian. He is their floodplain manager and environmental programs coordinator. We also have Gary Ashby, who is an engineer with Forest Grant Associates and is MDC's hired floodplain consultant. We're here today to tell you just a little bit about our efforts to remove a significant portion of MDC's downtown core out of the 100-year floodplain. The boundary shown in yellow on the map before you today indicates the boundary of MDC's downtown urban renewal district, which was established in 2002 by the city. Um, for reference, um, this is the Union Pacific uh, right away, and um, uh, City Hall is sitting right in this location. The current nine mile floodplain impact as per the adopted FEMA maps can be shown in the areas highlighted in orange and blue and extends to the west and, to, and through the heart of downtown and to the south. Nine Mile Creek runs through downtown through a series of culverts, pipelines, and open channels. Um, the current infrastructure, and you all, I think, know this a little bit through the crossover project that we did a number of years ago, is just significantly undersized, and it creates a flood risk to the number of properties and other critical infrastructure, including the Idaho Power substation on Franklin Road. Our biggest challenge is that most of the properties in this area were constructed prior to the floodplain being established. It creates or issues for property owners while trying to renovate, redevelop, or sell their properties. It also requires the additional expense of carrying floodplain insurance, which is a very heavy burden as this is our lowest income area within our community. This portion of downtown is made up of smaller individually owned properties. 
in order for many of them to redevelop, it would require raising those individual properties four, six, and even eight feet in some instances. And due to the size and scale of those properties, it's just not feasible. In 2017, our agency filed an appeal of the draft maps uh, for FEMA when we realized what are now the newly adopted maps would only worsen the floodplain impact on our downtown properties. As you know, um, and going through this process with all of us, FEMA, when they're analyzing their watersheds, they look at a 100,000 foot level. They don't look at the nitty gritty details and all the different drainages. Um, we were able to show enough data at what we call a 10,000 foot level, which would allow us to renegotiate the flood rate with FEMA in 2018. And this, this renegotiated flood rate or flow rate um, is informing the infrastructure design moving forward. I'm going to let Jason speak to the project logistics and how this will impact some of ACHD's assets. But before I do this, I want to give just a little bit of understanding uh, about the estimated project cost and what the FEMA grant would assist us with moving forward. We are currently revising the estimates for the FEMA application. This is due at the end of January of 2021. So we only have a couple of months left to pull this together. We believe the project at this time could be around $4 million. MDC's estimated revenue uh, for this current fiscal year, just to give some a perspective, is about 1.6 million. Our downtown district sunsets at the end of 2026. We don't have a whole lot of time left to be able to pull this project off. So funding is critical. This is a project we have been saving for over the course of the past several years. And if we were to get this grant, it would pay for 75% of the design and construction costs and MDC would pay the remaining $1 million. And this truly is an important project for our portion of downtown um, until this address is addressed, blight and continued deterioration of buildings will occur. By allowing these improvements, um, it will allow for future redevelopment of one of the most blighted areas in Meridian. And it will allow for the continued growth of downtown as real estate, as I'm sure you're aware, is quite limited in our little downtown core. It will allow for a 75% reduction in the number of infrastructures in the floodplain and will reduce the total value exposed, which is estimated to be around $49 million. It will also help protect the Idaho Power Substation, which is very important infrastructure. Our ultimate goal is to eliminate as many properties as possible from the floodplain and to provide economic opportunities for those property owners. Um, those areas shown in orange on the map would eventually be removed through these efforts. And with this, I'm going to turn this over to Jason and I will share a, another slide for him. Thank you, Ashley. <clears throat> Welcome, Jason. All right, thanks, Ashley. Um, Madam President, commissioners, thanks for having us um, the opportunity to present this project to you. Um, Ashley did a good job explaining the background and the implications of this project on the floodplain in downtown Meridian. Uh, to expand a little bit on the, the grant opportunity that we're pursuing, um, which is the reason we're before you now, um, it is a FEMA grant new this year, a uh, new program called Building Resilient Infrastructure Through Communities or the BRIC grant. And the city of Meridian will be the sub applicant under the state of Idaho Office of, Office of Emergency Management. So they are the applicant, we are the, the sub-applicant. Um, one of the things that makes this project eligible uh, for this grant is that it is identified in the Ada County Hazard Mitigation Plan. Um, I, this particular project as a whole is in the plan currently as of uh, last year. And each, a lot of these individual projects um, but I'll go over that you can see in the um, diagram in front of you are also in ACHD's portion of the Ada County Hazard Mitigation Plan. Um, we plan on applying for a phased project uh, from FEMA. Um, this allows us to apply with a 30% design um, and a benefit cost analysis um, that shows this project is been more beneficial than the cost and would allow us to finish the design for the first phase, um, reevaluate the project at that point, and if it still meets cost effectiveness requirements, 
um, we would get the remaining funding for the construction costs. Um, so it's the actual project here, the infrastructure. So I'll start um, is upstream to downstream, even though construction we'd probably go downstream upstream. So as actually described in the previous map, uh, there's several areas of overtopping of roadways from undersized culverts. One of those is at Franklin Road. Um, so we would need to install a inlet structure there in Discovery Park, and that would be on City of Meridian property. That would catch the overflow, uh, the overland flow from the 100-year flood event. Um, bore under Franklin Road, increase the size of that culvert, and then we'd have a, a split at that point at 2nd Street and uh, Franklin, where the existing pipeline of Nine Mile Creek, you could see that it's there on the left side. Um, most of the flow would go through that existing creek, but we would have a split there where high flows would be allowed to go down 2nd Street, where there's an existing ACHD storm drain, um, which we propose to increase the size of to allow those extra flows um, to use that existing you know, right of way where that pipe is to go down 2nd Street, um, where that flow would then come back together um, where the creek daylights, um, I believe that is a ACHD parcel there or, or right of way where we'd regrade that channel where it's uh, daylighted and then increase a culvert underneath Meridian Road um, and then do some rerouting through this property. Currently the creek goes underneath the Ida Pine buildings and it comes out through the tracks there. So that's where there are a lot of problems. So we would need to bore a new pipeline underneath the railroad tracks and then rejoin um, the creek channel and existing storm drain on the north side of the Union Pacific tracks. Um, so as far as uh, timelines on this project, um, as Ashley said, for the grant application, we ha need to have our application into the state of Idaho uh, December 15th, and then the state will apply um, by January 15th. And we would find out about any award costs um, in the summer of 2021. And during that period of time for the next few months, they would um, go through the environmental reviews, the outreach projects, vetting the project. Um, we wouldn't expect to get final award costs where we could start getting reimbursed for costs if you wait until the end of 2021. And then likely have the next year of, of final design and more outreach, um, more dealing with any kind of utility complex over that next year. and. Hopefully 2022 or, or 2023, uh, best case scenario um, for construction time. And with that, I will stand for any questions. All right, thank you very much, Jason. Commissioners, any questions, comments? All right, hearing none. Thank you, Jason. Madam Chair. Okay. Madam Chair, if I just may, um, I think that the one thing we're asking for you from you all today, uh, we're not asking for any funding. Uh, we're, we're just asking for a letter of support from ACHD uh, that was included in your packets. Um, so that would be really important to our application uh, to the state and ultimately then to FEMA. So if that is something that you feel that you all could support, we would be eternally grateful for that. All right. Thank you. Do we um, have Gary on with us? Are we going to hear from Gary Ashby or no? Uh, I'm, I'm, Gary well, there, yeah, I'm here for any questions, but, okay. but only if necessary, I think. All right. Thank you very much. All right, commissioners, you've uh, heard the presentation. They are requesting a letter of support. Any Madam, comments? Madam, Madam Chair, just a comment. Um, there actually wasn't anything attached to our agenda. Yeah. 
Um, so I'm not sure. Can we um, take action on this? I did. I didn't see anything attached either. Well, Madam President, we, or I think commissioners, I did Commissioner forward Baker. that letter. Uh, we could, and yeah, we you can post it. A letter we can get a letter for you for your approval. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, this is a work session. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, this is a work just, session. So, and I don't, I don't, I can't remember on the agenda if it's listed as an action item. Either. Can we just instruct staff to prepare a letter for uh, you to support? The uh, it's not an action item, but uh, you can, since it's not an action item, uh, Commissioner Hansen's correct, uh, but you can direct staff to prepare a letter for your uh, approval. Yeah, All right. I, I think that's a good good step forward. I think that would be fine. Yeah. Uh, Are there any any objections to doing that, commissioners? Ma Madam President, Is everybody I just on board? Have one question. Oh, uh, Mr. Price. The, the obviously you're just asking for support with the effort with FEMA, but do you foresee any request of ACHD for financial support for the effort? Um, Madam President and Mr. Price, no, we, at this time we do not. Um, as described, it's a 75%, 25% match. And so uh, MDC at this time is anticipating coming up with that 25% match. Excellent. Thank you. All right. All right, commissioners, you've heard the discussion. Any objection to having staff prepare a letter of support? I would be in favor of that. All right, hearing no objection, then we will ask staff to please move forward on doing that, just that. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, commissioners, next item on our work session, update on five mile road overpass and roadway expansion project presentation by staff. This again is for information only, and we will be hearing from Mr. Tom Furch. Welcome, Mr. Furch. It's good to see you. Good to see you also. Good afternoon, President May and members of the Commission. For the record, my name is Tom Furch and I am ACHD's Transportation Funding Coordinator. Today I would like to bring you up to date on the Five Mile Road Overpass and Roadway Expansion Project. Oops. So, um, uh, the image on the screen is the existing five mile road uh, overpass looking north. Okay, oh, we don't. Not sure All right. Screen. I think it's coming. It's not, not up there yet, Tom. I apologize. Well, okay. No, I'm, I just. Yeah. I just In the meantime, Madam President, I have a question for, for Tom. Is he growing a man bun? Pardon me? Are you growing a man bun? Your hair is no, getting No, no, that is not, not, not a man bun. There's no uh, bun to it. That no, no. Says... Eventually it will be. You need to be in Zoom. Then you need to share your screen. Oh, we want to share screen one. We're sharing it and then we move over to here and we then no there we go can you see me now <laughs> we can see you and your side <laughs> excellent excellent very good so uh, as I was pointing out the uh, the image on the screen is the existing five mile road overpass looking north um, ACHD and ITD are in the early stages of a cooperative project to design and rebuild the five mile road overpass and the road segments between just north of Overland Road and just south of Franklin. The finished project will look similar to the recently completed Cloverdale Road overpass and roadway project. The expansion of this overpass and adjacent roadway has been a long-standing priority for ACHD and ITD. The recently approved master street map and capital improvement plan highlight this segment as an existing deficiency that requires enhancement to accommodate current and future growth. 
Preliminary modeling and traffic analysis indicate that this project will enhance connectivity in this area by removing a bottleneck for vehicles, pedestrians, and bicyclists trying to cross over the interstate. Interstate 84 will also benefit with the elimination of a bottleneck caused by the structure of the existing bridge. The existing five mile road overpass was built 54 years ago in 1966 as part of the original construction of Interstate 84 and is the last original Interstate 84 overpass in urbanized Ada County. Note the red dot in the middle of the map. This dot indicates the location of the five mile, ro five mile road overpass. Of the 14 overpasses and interchanges crossing Interstate 84 in urbanized Ada County, ITD has improved or added a total of 13 structures since 1989 at a cost of roughly $232 million. Only Five Mile Road overpass built in 1966 remains to be upgraded. For a quick reference, in 1966, The Sound of Music won the Academy Award for Best Movie. Lyndon Johnson was president. The Beatles released hits like Eleanor Rigby and Yellow Submarine. The Vandals played their annual Boise home game and lost 7 to 28 to Oregon. And Boise was starting a period of significant growth with an estimated population of 64,000. This map provides you a better view of the location of this former farm to market road, which was originally constructed with just two travel lanes and no pedestrian or bicycle facilities. The segment in magenta is the portion of the road that would be improved. Five Mile Road is now a part of a major arterial network that connects the residences and businesses of South Boise with North Boise and Ada County. The existing constrained overpass structure creates a congested, high-stress route lacking safe facilities for cyclists and pedestrians. There are no sidewalks or bike lanes on the structure or immediately leading up to it. Intersection operations at Five Mile Road in Franklin and Five Mile Road in Overland Road currently experience more delay due to unbalanced lane usage caused by the Five Mile Road bottleneck. Projections for 2040 peak hour volumes are more than double what they are today. On Interstate 84, over 139,000 vehicles travel under the five mile road overpass daily. And like the old Cloverdale Road overpass, the existing bridge structure limits ITD's options for adding hot lanes, HOV lanes, or other congestion relief solutions to the interstate. As you can see in the picture, the FedEx truck is easily clearing the bridge structure, which is 16.33 feet high. But the bridge is also the last one in urbanized Ada County that does not meet ITD's minimum clearance standard of 17 feet. Uh, just to note, the Cloverdale Road overpass has a clearance of 17.5 feet. ACHD and ITD District 3 are actively seeking federal funding to pay for this project. In May, ACHD and District 3 submitted a joint application for a Better Utilizing Investment to Leverage Development, or BUILD, Transportation Discretionary Grant. The grant application was for $1.5 million to fund the environmental and design phases of the Five Mile Road overpass and roadway expansion project. ACHD was notified in September that our planning grant application did not receive funding. ACHD and District 3 staff met after that notification and confirmed that the Five Mile Road, five mile road project is still a priority for both agencies. We understand that to be competitive for a slice of a $1 billion nationwide grant competition, we need to prove local commitment. We agreed to complete the necessary environmental work and start that effort with, a budgeted, with budgeted local funds. 
I have also scheduled an application debrief with Federal Highways on Monday, November 9th. I will continue to work with ITD and ACHD staff and apply the lessons learned to improve any future application. The current budget estimate is based on our experience rebuilding the Cloverdale Road overpass and adjoining roadways. As you can see, the estimate for the completed five mile road project is nearly $18 million. Like the Cloverdale Road project, the five mile road overpass and roadway expansion project will be a joint ACHD and ITD project. ACHD and, and ITD are initiating the federal environmental preliminary design process this fiscal year with budgeted local funds. As I mentioned, completing the necessary environmental and preliminary design work will increase the chances of success for a future federal grant application. The goal is to secure federal dollars to pay for the final design, right-of-way acquisition, and construction costs of the project. Any additional local funding amounts needed for the environmental and preliminary design phase or federal match funding will be requested through the integrated five-year work plan and the annual budgeting process. This is a picture of the Cloverdale Road overpass, which was a successful joint project between ACHD and District 3, and represents the final objective of this project. Starting later in 2020, staff will work with Compass to add the five mile road overpass and roadway expansion project to the transportation improvement plan. Staff will work together to draft an interagency agreement between ACHD and ITD that will be presented to the Commission with a current goal of the, that presentation of May 2021. Working with ITD, a consultant will be selected to start the environmental and preliminary design work in June of 2021. And I will now stand for questions. All right, thank you very much, Tom. Great presentation. Commissioners, any questions or comments, please, for Tom? Uh, Madam Chair, just a couple of things. Uh, Commissioner Hansen. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I appreciate that. I noticed in the memo, just want to clarify the the uh, configuration on the bridge will actually be four lanes, not five, because there's obviously no place to turn. Um, and that um, the uh, uh, I would rank this at the same level of the importance also with the lender opportunity. And I don't know whether you can engage in same, the same kind of cooperative discussion with ITD on addressing the connectivity on lender. Um, the third comment is that um, we have had some incredibly good discussions with our uh, bike advisory committee on the best possible design. Um, so I would hope that they get involved real early on um, they have concerns about the way in which we designed the Cloverdale bike uh, paths, and people have tended to cycle on the sidewalks um, just because it's a little too close to very fast moving traffic. So um, I would encourage before deciding on a design that the bike advisory committee just get their hands on it and really dive in. They've given some really good input. So those are my comments. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Hansen. Any other comments or questions for Tom? Yes, Madam President. President. Uh, Commissioner Baker. Yeah, Tom, uh, I know you're going to be going to Compass in February to amend the TIP, but I suggest you give them a call in advance of that. They do have uh, experience in getting grants actually funded by the feds. So they might, I'd, I'd add them to the team just because, you know, because of that experience and they kind of know what's required and what isn't. So. Yeah, I, I talk with them. Uh, Madam President, uh, Commissioner Baker, yes, uh, just, just for your information, Compass has been involved in the current uh, grant process. They will be participating in the debrief also that we're going to be having, and they'll continue to be a partner. Very good. Thank you, Tom. Commissioner May. Any, any other questions? All right. Are you are you finished, Commissioner Baker? Is my microphone on? I, is okay. It yeah. Green? Yeah. I'm kind. I'm coming, Commissioner Arnold. Oh, I just okay. wanted to make sure Commissioner Baker didn't have a follow-on. Sorry. Okay, Commissioner Arnold, please. 
Thank you. Um, I, I provided a photograph uh, to staff that I took in April of this year. It shows a wheelchair, a man in a wheelchair crossing that overpass. And it really illustrates the need to do something there because he was in the travel lane uh, and there was no, no room. Um, so I'd like to have that photograph included in the record today and I'd like to have it included in the presentations to ITD and to FHWA because I, I think it, it's critical to show that there is truly a safety concern there. That would certainly help to further illustrate that need too. I'd like to see that picture as well. Do you have that? Um, um, I Madam emailed President, it to you, but Commissioner Arnold, I have not seen it yet today, but I would be very happy to bring that along uh, to include that in a in a presentation. We are trying to illustrate the the safety concerns. Okay. Um, and our application did include a, pede a pedestrian and a cyclist and i think a wheelchair would definitely be uh complement the the safety concern yeah it, it was an alarming picture to see this <laughs> this gentleman crossing that and commissioner may it's actually on my facebook page and i've gotten okay. um about 300 people that have looked at it and commented on it so okay i'll, I'll take a look for sure thank you commissioner arnold all right any other questions or comments for tom all right, hearing none. Tom, thank you very much. Good to see you. Thank you. Good. Appreciate the update and look forward to moving forward. All right, commissioners, that's our last last item. Remember, we don't have a meeting next Wednesday. Commissioner Hansen, enjoy your birthday tomorrow. And with that, um, enjoy the rest of the day if no one has any other comments. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate all you do. <laughs> and the phone rings. Oh,